I'm going to spend a little while thinking about supervision, what it is, how it's defined, what it's for, and how it's done. That how it's done, we're going to look at a few models of supervision in practice, and that's towards the end of this. So first of all, by supervision, I mean a rapport or relationship which enables one person to help another. And what we're helping them do is to see how they can think about their questions in a new and more productive way. That's a fairly broad definition, but we've got to remember supervision operates as a practice across a wide field of activity, so we need that, that latitude there. Here's that definition in slightly more detail. What I want to bring out is this notion of trust. If we don't have trust in our relationship of supervision, it's going to degenerate into overview, oversight, you know, that kind of, oh, he's getting at me or they're hiding stuff from me. And that's essential, that that doesn't happen because if we're going to help the other person develop their capabilities and enhance their effectiveness in their work, they've got to trust us. You know, if you're supervising me, I don't want to explore problems and weaknesses in my practice with you if I think you, you're just out to get me. Because all I see is you gathering more evidence of my incompetence, not, not that you're helping me to be better at my job. And similarly, if you don't trust me to tell you when I'm getting it wrong, then you won't reflect what I say to you in an honest way. You, you'll be more interested in, in putting the slant on it, saying, well, look, there is a, a, another problem here. The other thing that supervision's for is to handle our emotional responses. When we work in human support, whether it's the NHS or social work or public service of some sort, we encounter people when their lives are chaotic and difficult and they've got problems to handle. And that reminds us that human beings are fallible and they, they, they encounter difficulty. We are prone to things going wrong. And we don't like that. We don't like to be reminded of that stuff, especially if it's now our job to intervene and support. Because to be reminded of our own fallibility at precisely the point at which we're offering support is going to make us less confident and so undermine the confidence of the client in us. Think about the nurse in the accident and emergency ward. If the, the patient comes in having had a, an accident and the nurse's normal human response would be empathic pain, you know, to, to say, oh my word, how awful for you. Saying that does not help the patient. In fact, saying that undermines the patient's confidence in the system's ability to cope. So what you need to do is bracket that empathic response out just at that moment so that you can say what we need here is intubation and preparation for surgery or we need a saline drip and some pain relief or you know we need to make those assessments in that kind of clinical way that give the patient confidence that things are going to happen to make things better. Later on we're still going to have to handle the emotional response and that's what supervision is for in this sense. It's to keep us in touch with our emotions so that we don't wall off our humanity from our professionalism so that to stop us from becoming sort of too automated and too professional, anodyne, polished finish that when nothing reaches or touches us. People don't like that either. All right, I'm going to compare that with uh, Christian and Keto. So here I've been talking about purposes. Christian and Keto talk about the role itself. And the role is... What they're, what they're saying is, if you've got feelings or ideas or questions that maybe you don't know how to raise or address or, or deal with in some way, then supervision is the place to do that, because its role is to contain what you can't handle, just temporarily, whilst you make the adjustments that need to be made so that you can handle it. Um, so maybe I've got a client whose personal choices mean that his kids don't have enough food. You know, he doesn't handle his money well or something like that. And on a personal level, that just makes me flat out angry because he's not looking after his kids. But that anger, ain't that's no use. So I bracket that out, put it to one side, and I work with the guy. And then later on, having made some interventions that have actually been beneficial, I feel better about him and his family. And now I feel guilty for having been judgmentally angry about him. And you can see that anger and judgmental guilt are going to be at war with one another. They're going to be very hard to handle. Well, the supervisor's job is to help me handle those feelings, to show me ways in which I can think about those feelings that are going to make me better able to deal with that situation in the future. I'm going to add on a bit more now from Bluckert, who's a person working in coaching. Now, coaching, mentoring and supervision have a lot of overlap, which is why I feel comfortable borrowing their ideas. So the first thing that he says is that we, we must work in supervision with an ex, a more experienced person. Now, I don't know about more experienced, but certainly experience is, is very important. You can't supervise and help somebody handle this emotional stuff 
if you if you don't have enough experience yourself you're not going to be able to anticipate the range of possible emotional responses and that's important because you there's no good in me being blind to my emotional response turning to my supervisor to for guidance and reflection and they're being blind as well that would be the blind leading the blind that's no use to anybody so i don't know whether we need more experienced persons but certainly we need sufficiently experienced persons for supervisors Bluckett goes on to say that there are two basic purposes here and the first one is this learning and development stuff we mentioned before but the second one is the protection of the person being in his case coached but in our case our clients or service users because we make interventions on their behalf their interests need to be protected and normally we would trust in our standard operating procedures and professional code of conduct to do that but our standard operating procedures and professional code of conduct include supervision because it's acknowledged that you don't know the answer to all the possible questions in advance. You need to work some stuff out. And so we have to have that protection function coming out of supervision as well. So this describes what supervision is. This tells us what it does. And that division between what it is and what it does, that, that's classic in the academic discussion of supervision. So we're going to turn quickly now to what the functions are, summarise those before we move on to the models. So I'm paraphrasing Kedushin when I think about these functions and I'm drawing them out of what we've discussed so far. Kedushin doesn't say this stuff directly, his thinking on, on supervision is really rather more subtle than I'm going to present, but it's close enough to what he says to be considered to be like the bare bones maybe. So there are three essential functions, development, which is about helping us to develop our skills, understanding and capacities. And we do that through reflection on action in Sean's sense of the term. So in practice, we reflect in action and make small changes so that the outcome is improved. Later in supervision, we reflect on our practice, observe the small changes we made in action so that we can ask ourselves, could we have anticipated any of those problems? Were some of our modifications actually counterproductive? Why did we choose those things? That's, that's an important thing. There's the emotional maintenance function. So uh, helping the, the supervised person become aware of their emotional reactions so that they can deal with them. And very often, after people have been in practice for a while, they get so skilled at bracketing out their emotional response and so taken up with the speed of need that you do need the brakes putting on and somebody stopping you so that you can say, actually, no, I do feel really very, very angry about something. I, I can't just rush into the next case. I've got to take some time out to, to process some of my own emotional response. And finally, there's the, main, the monitoring thing. And this makes sure that the service of, that we provide are of a high quality and that the interests of clients and service users are protected. So those are the three functions of supervision. We're going to move on from there, from what supervision does, to what supervision is like. We're going to look at three different models that people have got, three, three different approaches to the way supervision can be done. Um, I should explain about models before we begin. A model is a formal description of something and it's often about providing specialist terms and concepts so that we can show that there's a consistency in our thinking. A model isn't a theory, it's how a theory, how a general theory is applied to a specific practice instance. So if, if the instance of practice is supervision, then the general theory, say uh, systems theory, that will give us a specific model, a way of doing things. And it would be different to, for example, the um, client-centered approach or a relationship-based approach in social work. So the theory that you operate with gives you different models. And the models tell us how a particular thing is to be done. There's a range of models that I'm going to look at. I have three of them. They, they're not sort of telling us what the, you know, the extremes of this are like. They're just they're just there to show what the differences could be like. So here's the first one we're going to see. This is Hawkins and Show. It's a rather famous seven-eyed model of supervision. And they say that a supervision session should incorporate, should pay attention to seven different perspectives. And they are the client. How did the service user or client present? What was their case history? Where did they come from? How were they referred? And this should also include, of course, the service provider or case worker. So how are you being affected by the work that you're doing with your client? So there's a bit of that stuff about emotional maintenance there, but also some stuff to do with reflecting on our interventions, whether or not the things that we're doing, we're doing as well as we could. Beyond the interventions, beyond the specifics, there's also the quality of the relationship with the client. And this is where the model is revealing something of its theoretical perspective, because it's focusing on this, these questions about things like, 
uh, history and development and normal dynamics. So that, that kind of looks to me a, a little bit sort of psychodynamic perhaps, or, or at least humanist in its approach. Um, and this here is obviously a transactional analysis kind of approach that's been taken. So if we go beyond there, um, the other perspectives to take into account, of course, the supervisor. How is the supervisor experiencing the session? So that, that perspective needs to be taken into account. And what's the relationship like with the supervised person? And this raises the interesting possibility that, that maybe this relationship in some way mirrors this relationship. Yeah, so if the client presents in a child ego state, forcing us into an adult ego state, is that something, is that a pattern that we see replicated here? And if it is, what are we going to do about it? And then finally, of course, we need to take into account to some extent the social, economic, cultural and organisational context that we're operating in. So this is like a way to condition your question about the, say, the interactions, or, sorry, the interventions. Um, is the planned intervention appropriate given the client's socio-economic background? Um, so <laughs> if, you, if you were planning, you know, some kind of, you'd got clients who weren't able to or, or were struggling to make their um, money go far enough in terms of feeding themselves and so you said well the intervention here is to is to send them on courses to learn how to make better use of the food that they buy you don't don't send them to the wrong kind of cooking course you know don't don't send somebody who is from uh, an islamic background to a non-halal cooking course so those are the seven perspectives that need to be taken into account when we're thinking about this stuff then we've got kagan and this is something a bit older this is interpersonal process recall uh, this comes from a broadly psychodynamic background. Kagan observes that we all need other people. We're social creatures and we need others and we're born in need. And as a consequence, our earliest experiences of need make us anxious because the people who supply our needs are in a position of greater power and authority over us. So where we have this need and this anxiety, we wind up with a classic pattern of response that gets called approach avoidance. And approach avoidance is the tendency to be diplomatic in order to avoid confrontation. So to use politeness and diplomacy to avoid confrontation and distress. And it's dysfunctional when it means that we don't do the right thing. So he, he notices it in two ways. First of all, there's a feigned naivety. And it's polite to feign naivety on occasions. So um, when adults are in company with each other, it is polite to feign a naivety about the other person's um, bad breath. Yeah, you, you don't immediately point out to the other guy, you need to use some mouthwash, you, you, you pretend not to notice. And that's fine for most human reactions, but in social work or in, in supporting human need, then you don't need that, that's going to get in the way. And we do it, Kagan argues, when we're unwilling to get too close to the other person. And that might be because we think they are going to do something that's going to result in an irreconcilable conflict. Yeah, they're, they're, they're about to, to pick a fight with us that we can't find a way away from. And so instead of pointing out that, you know, maybe the client presents with uh, signs and symptoms of self-neglect. And instead of us picking up on that, we think, oh, if I, the minute I say that, this guy's just going to go overboard about how like, you're always on about my cleanliness or whatever. So we, we just pretend not to have noticed. We do the polite thing. And that's not, not a good move. Um, alternatively, he talks about the tune out. And this is something that we see more commonly in less experienced practitioners, where they become, in a way, distracted by their own processes and thinking, and so they don't engage with the client, particularly things like nonverbal communication. It's very easy to tune out the nonverbal cues by becoming a bit absorbed in making your own notes. Um, and that's, that's a, a problem of attention, um, what, what you focus on, what's the, what's the focus of your interaction, should it be the client, should it be. So those are the things that he's focusing on anyway. Now, how do we deal with that? How does supervision handle that? So he says, first of all, before you go into the supervision session, the supervised person makes a record of their interaction with the client and shares it with the supervisor. Now, today we might well think of that as a taped record or a videoed record, but it could have been done with paper and pencil methods. We could have written a reflective account of the interaction. The supervisor then selects key sequences, what they think of as key sequences in the interaction. And then they present them at the start of the supervision session saying, look, I've picked out these things. There's going to be stuff in there that you haven't processed yet. And that's true. It wouldn't matter what I picked out. It would always be true that there's stuff that we've not processed. Because what we do is we tend to focus on specifics and drop the background detail. 
Well, the question that we're asking is, have we dropped the right background detail? Are we ignoring something significant there? Now, in order to answer that question, the supervisee is left in authority over the experience because they were there, they had the experience, it's theirs, so it's their job to tell us what it means. We don't impose our interpretation on what happened. But that leaves the supervisor in an inquirer role. So instead of saying, I'll tell you what went wrong here, mate, it's the job is to say, why do you think that? So we use open questions rather than closed or instruction in order to, to get the person to, to explore and reflect upon their own practice. And the inquirer, supervisor, is then, because they've handed the responsibility for the meaning over to the supervised person, in this inquiring role, you can actually be quite confrontational. You know, you don't, because you're saying, well, you, you're the one with the authority here, it's, all I'm doing is pointing out possible alternatives or asking questions. So I can actually ask quite prickly questions under those circumstances. There, there, there's no space in the IPR process for feigned naivety at this level. So here's some suggested open questions that might be used. Um, don't be drawn into trying to sort of write them down as a script. Practice them by all means with, with a colleague, with, with a mentor, with somebody else. But if you had them as a script, it's kind of, they, it becomes artificial very rapidly. You, know, you, you will be distracted by your script and you won't see the reality of, of the person you're supervising. Anyway, you can get a copy of those by printing out the, um, the PDF that goes with this presentation. Now we're going to move on quickly into the, the final model that I've got, and this is supervision as containment. It's more up to date. It comes from a conference that I attended recently um, where Professor Andrew Cooper presented a keynote address, and I was fortunate I managed to get a copy of his notes, which he's, he's allowed me to use here. So Cooper's position on, on what supervision is and does is very simple. He says, social work in general is about the containment of crisis. Our clients come to us in crisis, we contain that for them temporarily so that they can adjust in order to be able to handle it. And supervision is simply where I contain the frontline workers' crisis for them, you know, their emotional response to the crisis in their client, so that they can make the adjustments. But he also notices that there's a whole load of other factors that are pressurising the, the space in which supervision can take place. And he illustrates it like this with this kind of short history lesson. So he says, Sort of originally, there was the task at the coal face that was undertaken by a frontline professional. And they, as a consequence, experienced something called professional anxiety, which was fed into the container of supervision. So the organization provided a, a container for that anxiety so that the person could make the adjustments and, and deal with it. And this was sort of like in the, the pre purchasing days, before, before we realized things were, were going to be problematic. So maybe there's a bit of, I don't know, golden age thinking going on here. I don't. Certainly we can imagine that there might have been a past when there was a better fit between the professional, the anxiety generated by the professional task and the organization's ability to contain that for us. In the 80s, certainly this is the case, in the 80s, there was a broadly, uh, a groundswell realization that the welfare state couldn't be indefinitely extended because we were increasing the number of elderly people in our population, so it, retired people and smaller families don't generate as much tax, and so you can't have as big a welfare state. Also, medical processes were getting better, but they were increasingly expensive and extending lives that needed more support. So we brought in, we resisted, but eventually brought in cost-benefit analysis, which resulted in something called rationing anxiety. And that's where the, where the professional, not only now has to deal with the anxieties about their particular case, but also the organisation has to deal with the anxiety that it may not have enough resources to support the interventions that the professional is planning. And we didn't increase the capacity of the organisation to contain these anxieties. So now the organisational capacity is being used for two sources of anxiety. Professional anxiety is generated at the coalface and rationing anxiety, managerial concern, that's been generated out of the political context. Now, when we introduced rationing anxiety, fairly rapidly after it came performance and audit anxiety. Because if you've got a short supply of resources, you do want to know that they're being used effectively. And so that's, that's the next level of anxiety that came in. And when those two things came in, Cooper sees that as a, as a critical moment at which the capacity of the organisation to contain professional anxieties generated at the coalface 
that gets broken. And so this containment, this, these anxieties are no longer being contained within the centre of the organisation. They're being shoved out of this, the line of sight of senior managers. And the, this capacity for containment is now trying to be used to contain rationing and performance audit anxiety. And alongside that, we then get partnership anxiety. And that's because if you've got a shortage of resources that are being carefully audited, then there's a perception, at least, that the organisation isn't coping. And so it needs to be supplemented with partners. So that might be voluntary agencies and private partnership. But then that leads to another anxiety, doesn't it? I mean, who's in charge? Who's going to carry the can here if things go wrong? And ultimately, that expresses itself in terms of survival anxiety. If my department is not perceived to be able to work, even alongside a multidisciplinary, multi-agency approach, then maybe it's going to be submerged into something else. And all of those managerial anxieties have, in effect, pushed professional anxiety out of the, out of the container. It's, it's no longer being contained at all. And it's being left in lower down the hierarchy at the level of frontline operatives and uh, first level managers. So Cooper, having given us the little history lesson, paints that in a, in a slightly more specific way. He says task anxiety used to be handled by the black line there, supervision. Other anxieties emerged, rationing, performance and partnership, which resulted in a threat of failure. And all of these forces impinged directly onto task anxieties containment by supervision such that the fear of failure had to be contained instead. And so managerialism impinged on the front line, pushed the front line out of the centre of the, the model, if you like, and the professional self was forced into hiding. And that, that's his, his concern. He says that really the job of good quality supervision is to find a space away from all of these other anxieties so that we can still handle the old-fashioned, coal-face generated task anxiety of the professional. And supervision needs to not only be something that is done facing inwards towards the, the person who's being supervised, but it also needs to have an outward facing dimension that helps the organisation to protect the supervision space. Um, I've made a copy of the notes that, that he um, issued with his presentation so that you can print them off there, but it's essentially the stuff that I've been talking about. And that leaves me with just a few points to make about the nature of supervision and why we do it. I thought I'd finish with um, observations made by Laming. Uh, he's obviously talking about the Clambier incident, and um, his, this is his review in 2009, so this is, this is after the initial review and its findings have been published. Um, and he goes on, in, in his piece he says that there's a, a big concern about this reflective practice being put in danger because of an overemphasis on targets and the consequent loss of confidence among social workers. We know it's vitally important that social work is carried out in a supportive learning environment and we've known that since the very earliest days of, of the profession but we also know that there are an increasing number of pressures that are eroding this as Cooper has, has pointed out in his model of supervision. Nevertheless we still need that high quality organised uh, time and it needs to be on a routine basis, not just to review the quality of the decisions being made and, and to assess the risks that are being taken, but also to handle the emotional burden that goes with those tasks. And finally, he concludes with saying that supervision should be open and supportive. Um, just as we started out with the observation that supervision without trust would be a waste of time, if supervision isn't open and supportive, it doesn't take place in an atmosphere of trust, then we won't be able to focus on the quality of the decisions being made. The analyses of risk that we present will be poor and we will not improve the outcomes for children or any other service users.